So I hope that's interesting to you. If it's not, that's probably okay because every other talk at this conference looks amazing. Um, so who am I? I? I'm Tyler. I'm the CTO of Fastly. Um, what is Fastly? Fastly is an awesome content delivery network. We do all the things that a content delivery network normally does and then do things like real-time purging and analytics and whatever else, and that's the end of my sales pitch. Um, so what makes me qualified to be up here talking to you about this? Uh, absolutely nothing. Uh, I didn't go to university. Um, everything I know I have learned from reading books and papers and picking the brains of amazing engineers over the last 15 years I've been doing this. So I, I guess that's not nothing, but um, I guess I have written implementations of these things that we're going to be talking about, and I've used them successfully in production. That said, there are undoubtedly people in this room who know the math behind these and know the algorithms themselves better than I do. So if I say something stupid, please tell me. Um, also, I'm incredibly jet lagged, so also, if I just fall asleep up here, just let me, let me sleep, please. Um, right, so what is a probabilistic algorithm? Um, I guess formally it would be an algorithm that incorporates a, like, an element of randomness to it, right? Um, there's a few different ways that randomness gets into these algorithms. For some, it's literally a rand call. Uh, for others, you'll take the input data, you'll convert it into a form that is uniformly distributed, so hashing it, essentially. And for others, the randomness is actually intrinsic to the data itself. Um, so why am I up here talking about this at all? Uh, probabilistic algorithms exist to solve problems that are either impossible or unrealistic for us to solve uh, precisely. So they're too expensive, too time-consuming, etc. Um, to those who either deeply understand probability theory or who are like me and just have like used and observed these things in production for a long time, um, not only are, like, is like that precision trade-off there, like you know, accepting less uh, precision in order to like make the problem easier. Not only is that like acceptable, but we actually seek out chances to use them. Um, this is entirely because it lets us solve problems that we couldn't solve otherwise and create systems that are less expensive, more predictable, and so on. Um, I'm not normally one to read from my own slides. However, I really, really like this quote uh, that comes from the structure and interpretation of computer programs. So I'm going to do that. Uh, in testing primality of very large numbers chosen at random, the chance of stumbling upon a value that fools the Fermat test is less than the chance that cosmic radiation will cause a computer to make an error in carrying out a correct algorithm. Considering an algorithm to be inadequate for the first reason but not for the second illustrates the difference between mathematics and engineering. Um, it, I mean, it's obviously tongue-in-cheek, but I think it makes a good point in a way. Um, the other thing is that, like, speaking of cosmic radiation, uh, the world is probabilistic, the universe is probabilistic, or at least it's way too complex for us to actually model 100% correctly. Networks, and especially the internet, are especially probabilistic. Whether or not a particular packet will get where it needs to go is not something that we can actually have complete knowledge of. Um, which pass it will take when traversing all the networks that it needs to traverse to get from like point A to point B is also something that we can't possibly have knowledge of. And so systems that run across asynchronous or lossy networks are necessarily probabilistic, or at the very least they have to deal with the probabilistic nature of these systems. Um, so you can fight it, which is entirely reasonable. Um, and like many systems do that, like they try to build like reliable things on top of lossy probabilistic things underneath that. And that's a totally reasonable thing to do, um, but there's no avoiding the problem, right? Uh, and I, I feel like this, this slide is probably like totally wrong for the audience. You, like it doesn't seem like there's a lot of junior like developers here. However, in, in the past I've had to like, uh, in working with like uninitiated developers, I've, uh, I think the core of the issue that they end up having is that they believe that like, the idea behind a probabilistic algorithm is that it's just guessing, in a way. Um, that idea is, of course, not right. Um, probably probabilistic algorithms incorporate an element of randomness. Um, and the randomness I refer to here is something that can be quantified and analyzed. Um, in fact, it's crucial that that's the case, because otherwise it really would be just guessing. Um, furthermore, I've never seen a paper or on a probabilistic algorithm that did not quantify and prove the error rate of the algorithm. Um, this is incredibly important. Uh, it's the first thing I would look for, like if we were developing, the first thing I would do if we were developing a new one, right? So uh, it becomes incredibly important. So if, like if we look at bloom filters, for instance, right? Um, depending on the context in which they're being applied, the input can be large enough and the necessary error rate low enough that like this particular data structure, this probabilistic data structure, becomes entirely useless to us. 
right? You might as well just use a set at times. So the point is that like, you need to consider what your input size is and what the acceptable error rate is in order to use these things effectively. So when should we not use them? Right? Actually, no. Um, so many real world systems rely heavily on algorithms that have a probabilistic component because in fact the input data contains its own element of randomness. GPS navigation systems, self-driving cars, missile guidance systems, all of these use estimation algorithms, which arguably are using a probabilistic component in themselves. So then when should I use these? Well, probably more often than you think. Consider the acceptable error rate and how that affects the runtime or size of an algorithm or data structure, and then make decisions based off of that. Um, I found it to be surprisingly rare that the acceptable error rate for real world systems is actually 0%. Um, even though that's the intuitive response as soon as you ask someone, like, what's your acceptable error rate? Oh, nothing. N no, it's, it's not, actually. Um, considering the fact that we already talked about the fact that the world is probabilistic, you know, network cards die, cables are cut, configuration errors occur, machines burst into flames, like, the acceptable error rate for your real world problems is almost certainly not zero. So let's look at the first problem that we're going to consider. There's, there's two that we're going to consider. This is the first one. Um, this is the count distinct problem. It's the, the problem of uh, counting unique items in a stream that may contain duplicates. Or more formally, like finding the cardinality of a multiset. Uh, the real world problems that fall into this category, there's a bunch of them. Uh, you know, how many unique words are in a large corpus of text? You know, how many different users visited a popular website? How many unique IPs connected to a server? Uh, how many URLs have been requested through an HTTP proxy, for instance? Or what if you're trying to do the same thing but across an entire network? of proxies. Um, just like as a concrete example here, right, so this is our log of IP addresses. We would say, oh, okay, for this one, the count distinct is five, right? I think everybody gets it. Um, and so there's a naive solution to this. It's really super trivial. You probably already wrote the code in your head as soon as I started talking about it. You take a set, and then for every item in the stream, you add it to the set, and the output is the length of the set. It's very straightforward. Um, it's entirely possible we've already written this code in production before. And so, you know, for that naive solution, you know, adding an element is an amortized constant time operation. Finding the length, amortized constant time, or just regular constant time, Jesus. Uh, the space, however, does grow linearly with the number of entries that you add, right? And so, as with many problems, the difficulties with count distinct actually come with scale. Uh, it's really easy and cheap to count a thousand or a million unique users, IPs, URLs, or words, but how about a hundred million? Actually, that's still not too bad. Uh, how about a hundred million per server across thousands of servers? Now that's more interesting. Um, so if we, let's make that the problem then. You know, let's perform, perform a count distinct across a thousand servers, which could have each as many as a hundred million unique, unique items, and find the cardinality of the union of their results. In other words, distributed count distinct. So how would that be done? Well, let's look at another naive solution. Um, you know, great. It's really super simple again. Each server could keep a set of its seen items, just as in the you know, previous example. Uh, and when each finishes their individual count distinct run, they can just send that down to a central server and we'll just combine them all using like a union operator. Great. It's super simple and obvious. But of course, that precision comes at a cost. If each server is seeing like, as many as 100 million unique items, the size of that seam list is going to be significant. Even if you were to like, hash each of the inputs down to like a 64-bit integer, the size would be about 800 megabytes, you know, potentially per server. Each of those thousands of servers would then send their seam list down to the central server. Even in the case of just 1,000 servers, that's 800 gigs of data that we would be pumping into that like, combined cardinality function. Right? This clearly doesn't work. You either need to like install one of those big data systems, I think they call it now, uh, and then hire a team to run it, or find a different solution to the problem. So this is where uh, hyperlog log comes in. Hyperlog log takes a probabilistic approach to the count distinct problem. Uh, it's an extension of the earlier log log algorithm and attempts to like improve the, improve the accuracy of that. And it's been like pretty widely used over the past several years. Uh, the core of the algorithm actually arises from a couple simple, simple observations which we can easily show by walking through an example. Uh, let's, so let's say our input data is just a stream of URLs, right? So we'll take those URLs and we'll hash them using our awesome 8-bit hash function here. 
Um, and I'll, I'll spare you the lecture on bad hash functions. I assume you're going to use something reasonable. Um, and so what do we know about this number? Well, we know it's part of a uniform distribution, right? Ideally, anyway. It's part of a uniform distribution. Another way to say that is that the probability of any individual bit being set is 50%, which would then mean that the probability of, you know, one bit being set and another specific bit being set is 25%. And 12.5% for three of them, right? You probably see where I'm going with this. Um, and then so we can take those numbers, we turn them into an expected number of trials, right? So one bit being set will be expected trials of two, two bit set is four, three is eight, right? So in this case, expected trials is equivalent to, on average, the number of unique IP addresses or items or whatever that we're looking for that we have, that we have seen until we, ex excuse me, so in this case, expected trials is equivalent to the number of unique IP addresses until we expect to see this particular number of set bits. Again, jet lag, sorry. Um, so the first step then is to take the input item and hash it down to this uniformly distributed set of bits. Then count the number of leading bits that are set, keep a record of the maximum number of leading bits that have been set so far. This would give a really very rough estimate of the number of unique items that each of these things has seen. If there's one leading bit set, then you'd expect that the number of unique items is two. If you've seen three leading bit set, then on average you'll have seen eight. Again, this would be a very rough estimate. So the unique idea behind log log and hyper log log is, divide, is to divide the incoming items into a series of buckets um, based on the trailing bits. Right? We were looking at the leading bits before, and now we're going to look at the trailing bits. And then remember the maximum number of leading bits set per bucket. right? So by dividing up the incoming items into buckets like this, you can develop a much more accurate estimation of the total cardinality. If you have m buckets and n unique items, then on average, each bucket will have seen n over m unique items. Um, so taking the mean of those buckets gives you a reasonable estimate of the log base 2 of n over m, um, from which you can easily generate an estimate. And so that's actually a pretty complete implementation of log log in about 15 lines of Python. And uh, I'm not actually going to like try to walk through this or anything, but like I, I just kind of put it up here as like a demonstration of the fact that it's actually a reasonable algorithm to write. Like it doesn't actually take that much work to make this happen. Um, furthermore, hyperlog log has this really neat property where if you take separate instances of it with the same number of buckets and then, uh, 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 excuse me, Right, take separate in in instances of this hyperlog log with the same number of buckets. You can actually just take the maximum of each of the like corresponding buckets and it'll give you a pretty good union of them as well. So basically we just did this in place of our set that we had before, where now the amount of space is actually the log of the log of n rather than linear. And this is like actually the neat part. So according to the analysis done by the authors of the paper, you can expect an accuracy of about, you know, within about 2%, right? Um, while using roughly one and a half kilobytes of space for the buckets. So each server keeps its own one and a half kilobyte hyperlog log, then sends it down to that central server again, let's say. For 1,000 servers, the central server is now processing one and a half megabytes of data instead of 800 gigabytes in our like incredibly naive example before. So you're processing like 0.0002% of the data you had to look at before. Um, and the thing is, this like, this completely changes the economics of a problem like this, right? Like suddenly you could actually like run many of these in parallel. You could run them more frequently. You wouldn't need a big data system or a team to run it. Um, you wouldn't even really need more than one server, honestly. Like, and all that for a cost of a 2% skew in your estimates. Now, whether or not that skew is acceptable is entirely dependent on your particular use case, of course. Um, but ultimately, what this probabilistic algorithm has done for us is made it possible to do something that we would not have been able to do before, right? Being able to give, like, potentially, like, uh, being able to give our customers, right, the ability to see, like, this, these are the, like, number of unique objects that you actually have stored in a CDN, right? No one's been able to do that before. And, like, so if we can do that with a 2% error rate, that's still totally worth it. So let's look at another problem. Oh, I put an animation in, that's great. Uh, cool. So a second problem. Reliable broadcast, right? So it's a system that needs to send messages to a known set of processes reliably. 
simple as that. Um, and the use case that I've had for this in the past is, um, is being able to send around purge messages. So essentially what people do is, you know, they're storing things in a CDN and they go, hey, this thing has changed in the origin, so get rid of this particular URL that you've stored everywhere around the world. Um, in this particular case, one of, like, one of our unique competitive advantages is the, the ability to remove that content from our network really, really, really quickly. Um, and so latency is thus an important factor here, but reliability is always paramount. We can't just lose purge requests. That would be really problematic. So the obvious and naive solution, since apparently I'm going through those for each of these, is to have a single source of truth, right? So if we had a single sync that all purge messages could go through, that would make it really easy for us to like monitor the system and make sure that it stays consistent. In the very early days when we were just trying to like launch a thing and not go bankrupt, uh, that's exactly what we did. Uh, however, that simplicity comes with its own set of pains, right? Having a single source of truth for this is also a single source of failures for this. Uh, and anyone who knows the first thing about distributed systems can see like why having that single point of failure is a problem. Um, and so our central sync didn't last very long. We pretty quickly had to build something else, build something better. So first we had to figure out what something better would actually look like. Uh, and so, you know, at first glance, this kind of looked like an atomic broadcast problem to me. Um, however, it doesn't quite fit. Uh, atomic broadcast is an all or nothing sort of thing. And if we can't get consensus for the whole network, then the purge would fail. Um, and that's not at all what we actually want, right? Getting the message to 95% of the servers really quickly, and then eventually getting the other 5% would be like far superior for us. Um, and so <clears throat> that brought us to reliable broadcast protocols. So this includes things like SRM uh, and a bunch of others, actually. So most of these algorithms were designed in the 80s, and they used what's called a retry strategy. Um, by retry strategy, what I mean is that the sending process is basically responsible for making sure that the receiving process receives and processes the message. Uh, unfortunately, this kind of limits the scalability of a system like this. Uh, it means that during partitions, load on the sending processes can skyrocket, right? Um, and if I know anything about the internet, I know that partitions happen all the time. Um, so that eventually led us to gossip protocols. Um, so things like Plumtree and Sprinkle. Um, the main difference between these and the reliable broadcast papers that we were looking at before was that they're designed to be much more scalable. So scalable to like tens of thousands of servers, hundreds of, south, hundreds of thousands of messages per second. Um, and the research on like gossip protocols is still continuing down to this day. And there's probably people in the room who have been working on this actually. Um, <clears throat> to get this higher scale though, uh, what these systems usually provide is actually probabilistic guarantees rather than like very firm, rather than strong guarantees in this case. Um, that the message will be delivered instead of guarantees, excuse me, they provide probabilistic guarantees that the message will be delivered to all servers rather than strong ones. Um, and so what we ended up deciding to implement in this case is actually bimodal multicast, uh, which came out of Cornell several years ago. So just like a quick breakdown of how this actually works. Um, there's essentially like three phases, but in this case, basically just two. So uh, we broadcast the message to all of the processes that we want to see. We do that like, you know, we send that out as quickly as possible. And then we gossip to make sure that everything continuously stays in sync. So, uh, right. So if we break it down into phases, we send the message to all the other servers. It doesn't matter if it's actually delivered here. Uh, you could use IP multicast if, it's, if that's available. You could use UDP in a for loop, which is what we did initially. You could use carrier pigeons. It doesn't really matter. Like This is just a protocol, not an implementation. Um, the next phase is that every, every server, every so often, will pick a server at random and send it a digest of all the messages that they have seen so far. Right? Um, so in this case, A picks B, P, B picks C, and so on. So the server looks at the digest it received and says, Ah, does this match what I've seen so far? Oh, no, I'm missing a few of these. Okay, I'll send a recovery message saying I would like these particular messages, and then the server that you sent the gossip to will send those to you as well, which is what happens in this phase. Uh, so does that make sense so far? All good? Cool. Um, and so for some reason, I decided to put this like neat little thing in here, basically just showing how gossip works. It's an epidemic protocol. You all know what that is. Um, 
Right, so it exhibits epidemic behavior. So <clears throat> the paper includes a bunch of math to predict the expected percentage of servers uh, receiving a message after some number of rounds of gossip. Uh, and so basically in this case, what we're looking at is like after 10 rounds with 0% packet loss, we would expect 96.5% of servers to have received a message. Good enough. Um, right. Sorry, again, jet lag. Uh, right, so essentially the problem is like 97% is, is, is okay, I guess, but like really the, the ultimate issue is that like we see high packet loss all the time. And so even after 10 rounds, we're not actually expecting to see 97% of servers to have received it. We would actually expect, in the case of 50% packet loss, something more like 37% of servers to receive it. Um, and so one of the neat things about, generally with probabilistic algorithms, but with this one in particular, is that so many of the things are tunable. Like you can actually change what the probability is. And so in this case, we don't actually just have to keep it for 10 rounds, even though that's what the paper recommends to us. Instead, we could keep it for, I don't know, something like 80,000 rounds. Um, and so this is, this is kind of a neat graph in my opinion. So if we, you can see down there, we're actually assuming a 99% packet loss. But if we keep it around for 80,000 rounds, uh, the probability of us losing a purge becomes smaller than the probability that I'll be struck by lightning multiple times during this talk. And yes, I actually looked that up to figure out what that probability is. Um, so the, the point really is that like, with high probability is fine, as long as you know what that probability is. So how does the system work in the real world? Um, well, usually, typically, we're seeing like 0% packet loss just like at, at, at a normal, like normal operating procedure across the internet, it's something like 0.1% 0, 0 packet loss. And so thus, the 95th percentile delivery for purges for us, for messages for us, is actually just one-way network latency, which is kind of cool. Uh, most purges are sent from the US, and so like the 95th percentile for latency for most purges is actually well below 150 milliseconds across the world, which is pretty cool. Um, and so I have an example of like what happens when we do have packet loss though. And so on the left, uh, that is completely unreadable, uh, but on the left you can see the number of purges that have been recovered over time. Um, and on the right you can see the, uh, the throughput of machines that were affected by this packet loss uh, instance and ones that were not. And if you're trying to see what the difference between those two graphs are, like on the right side there, there isn't one. Essentially, this system, despite having like a, on a, between 30 and 50% packet loss, was keeping up perfectly, or as close to perfectly as it could, and recovering messages very quickly. Um, so, kind of the, the idea with this section is that good systems are boring, right? I don't really like this, like trying to debug distributed algorithms at two in the morning. I don't think you do either. Um, it's nice to be able to like, you know, sleep through the night. Um, and so, that's kind of the point of that, that second one. But what was the overall point again? Uh, there's two, really. Probabilistic algorithms. So in the case of hyperlog log, you know, it allows us to build things that we couldn't or wouldn't build otherwise. Um, in some cases, it can completely change the economics of like building a particular system. Um, and then the second thing is that like, we can build systems that are more reliable. In the case of bimodal multicast, you know, this, you know we, we ended up building a system that is highly reliable and ultimately boring, right? Um, so rather than battling network partitions and outages, we build a system that just accepts that they're a thing and is eventually consistent um, without requiring infinite memory in this case. So that's all I got. Thank you. Uh, the, the last point um, ins made me think of the work of uh, Peter Bayliss and others uh, about oh, yeah. uh, probabilistically bounded staleness, which is about the same thing. Yep. It's uh, instead of uh, going for a strong consistency, which gives you all these scalability limits, um, you just allow certain deviations and then you calculate how, how likely is it to see a stale read, for example, from my database. Indeed. And most for most people, they, they intuitively say, it must not ever happen. And then you need to dig hard and say, uh, okay, what, what if it happens, right? What if it happens for, the, for these other reasons? And then you find, okay, 100 milliseconds might be fine. And then you gain a lot of freedom. So yes. this, this is a, a pattern that I see recurring in many places. Yeah, the, the work that Peter Bellis and others have been doing out, uh, uh, he's out of Berkeley, right? Yeah. 
it's just tremendous. Uh, I, I can't remember the name of the actual, like, uh, of, of some of the principles that they were coming up with, but I've been following their work for quite a while now. It's, it's really, it's really, uh, really cool. <laughs> Anything else? No? Uh, just a general question. Uh, don't you think that connections happening, uh, I mean, uh, messages being transferred between the nodes in the gossip protocol, that, does that turn out to be an issue with the number of nodes being very high? I'm sorry, I didn't quite follow that. Could you repeat the question again? So let's say if the nodes are very high, so they have to send a lot of messages to each other. Sure. So does that turn out, turn out to be an issue? So currently that's not an issue for us. However, um, I have been like pondering what to do when it does become an issue. And there's a bunch of different things we could do, including like um, essentially like dividing up the, uh, the purges such that they like only go to machines that are likely to have that content, as well as dividing customers into like certain subsets of machines. So purges for particular customers would only like go to those particular machines. So there's a bunch of different ways you can partition the problem. So basically sharding it again on a more global level, yeah. Yeah, basically. Yeah. Yeah, I have a question. Uh, because this uh, all works, and I saw it working in, uh, for example, some risk management and so on, where all the things are probable and everything is, you have a chance of losing that amount of money. But what about, for example, systems? Uh, which kind of have to be more reliable. I was having these problems uh, some time ago, mm -hmm. but uh, it was very important for me to get the communication, or to ensure communication won't fail. <coughs> the problem with this was that actually after first acknowledgement, then you have to get acknowledgement, that you get acknowledgement, <laughs> and so on, and so on, and so on. Right. Uh, do you have some uh, better idea for these problems? I have some better idea for those problems. Um, no, I don't, unfortunately. Like, I mean, there are certainly, there, there, there are certain problems where like, you know, a probabilistic algorithm just doesn't actually make sense for it, right? Like if, if you actually do need it to be 100%, if you do need like, you know, to, you know, be able to like go to sleep at night and know that it's never going to drop a single message, I can't actually think of a problem where that's the case, but like if you have one, then like I totally get that. Uh, one, one more remark to that. Uh, th there are some um, results like the FLP result uh, that consensus is impossible to achieve if uh, you have a, a faulty process and so on. So uh, also, I, I worked in a completely different uh, industry before um, operating satellites. And well, things must not fail, right? It costs billions <laughs> if it fails. Uh, well, losing a life is also uh, something you do not want to contemplate, but in the end, uh, there is a failure probability for everything, even if you think that you covered all the cases. I mean, cosmic radiation is not the only thing that can kill you. So uh, this probability of zero is, has been uh, an illusion always. Yeah, and indeed, and that's the, exactly the point I was trying to make there early on in the talk, so yeah, I appreciate it. Uh, sure. Hey. Hey. Uh, I missed the beginning, Tyler. I apologize, but okay, man. Uh, I was running around. But so you might have answered this already. But I, I'm just curious if you evaluated other epidemic uh, like protocols, such as like epidemic broadcast trees or something like that, um, given the complexities in debugging bimodal multicast, just because it's like the combination of two protocols, um, and just what your thoughts on that were. Yeah. So. Uh, I think when we, we, when we started building the system, Sprinkler, for instance, had just come out. Uh, I think it was right around the same time. And in retrospect, I totally would have probably built the system based on that instead. Um, but we did look at some of the others, and ultimately we just decided this one was like the simpler, like we, this is the one that we could, uh, that we had the best understanding of after reading the paper. So some of the others were really cool, but on the other hand, like if we couldn't like really internalize how exactly they worked, like it made it much easier to build the system ultimately. Uh, so when you're fine-tuning these algorithms that you pick um, and you need to know some other failure probability parameters, what kind of failure probabilities do you usually consider? Um, besides like latency and stuff like that, what are some examples and where do you get your numbers from? Oh, so essentially how do you decide you know, what, what, what error rate is acceptable? Oh man, dude, that's totally above my pay grade. I don't know. Like, uh, no. So, um, 
So deciding like what error percentage is, is acceptable. Um, honestly, like the, the way that I've gone about doing this in the past is actually just talking to our users about it. Like going like, hey, so here's the thing that we would like to build. We would like to be able to show you what the total number of objects you have across the world is and so on. What if that were 1% inaccurate, 2%, 3%, 5% inaccurate? And just seeing like what they actually would find useful. Um, I think this is I, I think it's this is essentially a UX problem, having that UX. Uh, yeah, that's what I got. Okay, one last question. You observed the error rate. Does it match prediction of the theory? I'm like sorry, can you say it again? If you have, for example, like your formula predict two percent error rate, do you observe it, or have you observed for significantly higher error rates than predicted by theory? By theory, for example. Uh, so for hyperlog log in particular, or mm -hmm. you mean for hyperlog log in particular? Yeah, for hyperlog or for example, yeah, for a second problem, yeah. Oh. Um, so yes, I have. I've seen like totally like off the wall error rates with hyperlog log, and then it turned out I was using it wrong. Um, essentially, like the number of buckets that you have and the amount of space that you create for like the uh, for the particular um, for the particular instances makes a huge difference, as it turns out. Um, and then of course, like it is a probabilistic algorithm, right? Like you'll there are times when you'll see something that's like completely off the wall, um, but it is just incredibly rare. Okay, thanks. Yeah. All right. Okay, thank let, you. Let's thank our speaker again. <laughs>